Hello, everyone. Welcome. Just going to show some slides here. Okay, great. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on the maze at Windermere. My name is Sarah Speltz, and I'm an associate director in the BU Alumni Relations Office. Today's webinar is sponsored by the BU Alumni Association and is offered as part of our alumni educational programming. Many of our programs are held on campus, but we offer educational webinars because we want to connect with alumni around the globe. And we do have alumni joining us today from California, Connecticut, Florida, Georgia, Michigan, North Carolina, New Mexico, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Texas, Virginia, Washington, and of course, Massachusetts. We also have alumni listening from Switzerland and Morocco, which is just great. We're happy that you're here with us today. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, this webinar is being hosted on our Zoom online meeting platform. If you experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of this presentation, you can contact the phone number you see on your screen. And I will also read that in case you're having a little trouble with your um, screen. So the number is 1-888-799-9666. Today's presentation is being recorded. So it will be on our website and that is bu.edu slash alumni. So our, our speaker, our author today is eager to answer your questions and you can submit them anytime through the Q&A box. All right, so let's introduce our speaker. So joining us today from Minnesota, which just happens to be my home state, is Gregory Blake Smith. He is a 1981 graduate of BU's creative writing program, part of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. He is an award-winning author of four novels, including The Divine Comedy of John Venner, a New York Times notable book. His short story collection, The Law of Miracles, won the Juniper Prize and the Minnesota Book Award. He has received a Stegner Fellowship at Stanford University and the George Bennett Fellowship at Phillips Exeter Academy, grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Bush Foundation, and the Minnesota State Arts Board. He is currently the Lloyd P. Johnson Norwest Professor of English and the Liberal Arts at Carleton College. Greg, thank you so much for being here today. Let's jump right in. Um, oh, I'm just gonna keep it on here for one second. All right, so first, just tell us what it's like in Minnesota. I'm actually sitting on the BU campus in the castle which is now the DeHode Family Alumni Center, and it has just started snowing. <laughs> What's it like where you are? Well, it's very cold, as it tends to be in Minnesota in <laughs> January. Um, it's probably about 16 degrees out right now, which is sort of average, I think. Um, supposedly, it's going to warm up for the next two weeks. By warm, I mean get into the 20s, which will feel spring-like. Yes, <laughs> I'm familiar. <laughs> Uh, well, first, before we start in on the questions, um, and again, I'll just remind everyone, you can submit questions anytime, so go right ahead. Um, but Greg, first, I want to congratulate you on the fact that this book landed on a number of must-read lists, including most recently the Washington Post's Best Books of 2018, um, and they called it, quote, staggeringly brilliant. That's really exciting, and it must be gratifying after all of the time spent um, preparing and crafting this novel. How are you feeling? Well, I've been waiting my whole life for someone to call me staggeringly brilliant. Um, <laughs> in fact, I'm walking around our house saying, I'm staggeringly brilliant. And my wife is always saying, it's the book that's staggeringly brilliant, dear, not you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so before we actually talk about the book itself, um, can we talk about your background a little bit? Where did you go to school sure. before um, coming to BU? Yeah, um, I actually uh, had a sort of checkered uh, undergraduate career. I went off to a place called Keene State College, 
um, which is in southern New Hampshire, and not a very good college, I, I have to say. Um, and I quit after a couple of years. Uh, and then one day the phrase, you don't hear this phrase anymore, but back then during the Vietnam War, uh, there was a, these things called college dropouts. And the phrase college dropout came to my mind. And I didn't like the sound of that. So I looked around for a college that was close to me. I was living on the coast of Maine at the time. And it was Bowdoin College. And I didn't really know Bowdoin was as good a college as it was. It was just the nearest college. So I applied there and I finished up my BA there and uh, thought I was gonna go off and get a PhD uh, in, in English and become a college professor. It seemed like an easy gig. <laughs> So I went off to Berkeley uh, as a young man to the PhD program in English. Uh, I went to one class and then quit uh, because it became clear to me that the idea of, uh, my idea was sort of, I was going to be writing my first novel because I always wanted to be a writer. I was going to write my first novel and sort of get a PhD on the side. The first two people I met at, met at Berkeley were both Harvard grads and super, super smart. And it suddenly came to me that, getting a PhD on the side was not how you did it. And you really were going to have to throw yourself into this. So I had to make this decision about was it, whether it was going to be a PhD English professor or a writer. And the writer won. And so that's, uh, that's how I got out of the uh, PhD biz anyway. <laughs> and then uh, what brought you to BU? And do you have some memories of right. so, BU so or the creative this, writing this, one, this wonderful first novel I was supposed to be writing. Um, uh, it took me a number of years, uh, and uh, I was living in Boston at the time and had to support myself. So I got a job as a secretary um, at BU, and I was working as a secretary in the economics department. This was probably the lowest point of my life, I have to say. <laughs> BU was the lowest point of my life. I'm working as a secretary for college professors, having quit the PhD program at Berkeley, and I, I was supposed to be the college professor, but here I was uh, working there. And it came to my attention that you could take free classes as if you're a staff member. I don't know if that's still, the, so this is 35 years ago. Um, I don't know if that's still the case, but uh, I thought, well, as long as I'm here, I might as well take a class. So I, I opened up the catalog and looked at English and saw that there was a, a writing program, graduate writing courses and so forth. So I called up the secretary for the writing program and said, hey, can I take one of those courses? And I realized now she, she was trying to get rid of me uh, because they didn't want, these are graduate level courses. I don't think they wanted staff people taking them. So uh, she said I would have to apply uh, properly with manuscript and so forth to do it. And I thought, well, what the heck, I will do that. Um, and I did. And Leslie Epstein, who was the, the head of the program in those days, liked what he read um, and actually invited me into the into the graduate program and I thought well why not uh, so I did and spent a year there taking writing workshops with some really fine people including Leslie who I thought was really a terrific teacher and I got my MA uh, from BU from that program and uh, it changed turned my life around uh, for years real seriously years I used to say that Leslie Epstein had saved my life. Because as I say, this was at a really low point of my life and feeling like this whole writer thing was not gonna work out. Um, but he helped get me back on track. Um, and he, he did, he sort of saved me. That's amazing. And you know, Professor Epstein is still around. I'm sure he would love to hear that. And we love to hear stories about BU having a positive influence on people. So that's yeah. great. Um, all right, so I have my copy of the book here. There you go. It's great, um, and I loved it. I have to say, it's been a few months since I finished reading it, so I didn't have to review a little bit this week so I could remember everything. And I was very much drawn in um, because I love Newport, because I'm a huge tennis fan, actually, so wow. I was interested in the fact that you had a, um, a tennis player as one of your main characters. Um, but I'm curious to know, uh, this idea that you had for the book to weave five characters, five time periods, five stories, were you at all daunted by this? Did you, did you conceive of it all at once or did you gradually add on? Because if it was me embarking on this, I would be kind of terrified by my own idea. 
Yeah. <laughs> so how did you how did you tackle this? You know, I wasn't I wasn't frightened by that, and in a lot of ways, uh, five shortish novels all put together into a single novel is less daunting to me than the single novel, which means you have to have a single subject, a single main character, and and uh, have that last throughout the 300 or 400 pages. Um, there is a certain amount of dauntingness to having five interweaving stories. Uh, that's, that's true. Um, but I didn't really frighten me um, so much. And in fact, at one point it was six stories. There actually was a, supposed to be a sixth idea. I never did write, begin writing that. In fact, I folded the sixth idea into the uh, into the 17th century section, um, that 1692 section you see. Yeah, and I just put up my little um, slide here to show the five eras with the five characters so, um, so everyone can sort of follow along too. So keep going, sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. So there was, at one point, there was this sixth part, um, which was supposed to be about, a, and this was based on a true, a true, a true thing, um, an enslaved, uh, a free man um, sold himself back into slavery as a way of buying the freedom of the woman he loved. And that was going to be this sixth story, but it became clear to me that six was going to be too much. Some people would say five is too many, um, but six was definitely going to be too many. And I had the idea that that, that sub-story, if you will, of the, of the cabinet maker in, in, in the 1692 section, selling himself into slavery to win Ash's freedom, that that could actually be folded into Prudy's story, uh, Prudence Selwyn. Uh, and that worked out really nicely. It became a kind of double story that way. That's great. So, and this is sort of a procedural question, but did you have to do a storyboard, I guess that might be kind of a screenwriting technique, but did you have to storyboard? Did you have to keep track of each one in a way? And, and how did you keep track of how each character was going to speak? Because it very much reflects the era. Um, there's a couple of quotes that some critics would use to show the difference because you have on the top of the screen how the character in 2011 would, would speak and then at the bottom how Prudy would talk, which is, you know, 400 years or 300 years removed. So um, how did you figure all of that out? Yeah, that, I get asked that question a lot. That seems to be really um, puzzling to people. Um, for, so for those who haven't read the book, each of the sections is written in the voice, um, either first person voice, three of them are written in the first person voice of, um, of the main characters. Um, and the two others are written in um, third person, but they're highly inflected with the language of the main character of, that, of those sections. So each one is very, very different, written in a very different um, English, the English of the era. And I get, as I say, I get asked that question a lot. Um, I did do some research, of course. I, I tried to read some Quaker diaries, uh, early, early Quaker diaries. Um, uh, I looked at an 18th century diary of a, of a British man who served in Newport, Cambridge as well for that matter, Cambridge and Newport during uh, the American Revolution. And you just sort of absorb the language into you. Um, and also I've been a reader my whole life and I studied um, literature of different centuries. So I have the language in me that way, but I can't really answer how these voices come to me. Um, they just do. Uh, I hope they're right or accurate enough. Um, it's quite a blast actually to <laughs> write in the language um, of characters so far removed from you. One of the things I really wanted to guard against in writing this book was merely dressing up modern people in old clothes, which I think a lot of, this is not really a historical novel because it has a section that takes place in the 21st century. But a lot of books that have uh, historical time periods, uh, action in, in earlier eras, the characters are essentially modern people. Um, the number of books I've seen where the women all seem to be 20th century feminists, even though it's the 17th century or something. That seems really fake to me. Um, I think it's much more interesting really to see these women characters or the African-American indentured characters, to see them work 
their lives out in the context of the social structures um, that surround them and limit them in a lot of ways. Um, so I really, try, I didn't want to dress up. I think there's a writer, who was it now? I think it was Edmund White said, dress up modern characters in historical drag. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to try to really get into the mind and the heart of a 17th century girl or 18th century British man um, serving during the revolution. I wanted to get into who they were in their language and in the world that they lived in rather than simply taking a modern self um, and pretending that they're in the 18th century or something. And a large part of that was the language. It was the, it's the language that makes them, I think, makes them feel like that they really are uh, from those earlier centuries. That, it's really interesting because I feel like there are so many, and you know, more than books, I would say, the, the TV shows and the movies that are, maybe more TV shows that are out there right now that are definitely set in a historical period, but the characters are definitely acting like modern figures. And of course, that's for a TV show. And you know, I happen to love the historical dramas that are on TV, but it's interesting that you purposely were trying to you know, keep them true to where they were living. And I think also because each of the characters really has a kind of a major problem to work out and they have to solve it within the constraints of their era, like you said. Yeah. Um, but they do all seem to have something. Oh, go ahead. What were you going to say? No, I was just going to add that uh, my wife and I have been watching the whatever Mrs. Maisel uh, <laughs> show. And one of the characters in that, so this show takes place in the late 1950s with Lenny Bruce. One of the characters in that show said something about, he would be there for her. I'll be there for you. Well, that's a, that's a line from Friends era, right? That's not something people were saying in the 1950s. And that kind of thing drives me crazy. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear people speak the way they spoke in the 1950s or the 1850s or whatever, and not just have... Uh, cars from the 1950s going by in the streets, but the characters are essentially uh, 21st century people. So yeah, I'm in agreement with you. Well, and to continue in the, in the um, vein of research and, and history, um, you definitely went to Newport, right? And you must have had to know the, the city, the area pretty well. Um, and also each of these historical periods seemed to me to be extremely detailed down to the things they were eating and drinking, like lime rickies during the, um, you know, during the time of Franklin Drexel and, you know, what they were reading and listening to, all of that is very, very specific. So do you just happen to be really good at knowing those sorts of things or did that become part of the research too? Yeah, you know, that's interesting too. There's, there's no research. Well, that's not completely true. Some of the really earlier eras, I would read books or try to find books or read parts of books that seem to be giving me um, bits and pieces of stuff that you couldn't possibly otherwise know. For instance, I'm remembering that um, for the 17th century section, uh, some of the children in that section play at a game called Hogo How Many, uh, which you play with corn cobs, if I'm remembering correctly. Hogo How Many. And I found that in a book. And that sort of thing is worth its weight in gold because it really just sounds, just, just sounds like that's something that kids played in the 17th century that we don't do anymore. So you would find bits and pieces like that and import them into, find a way of bringing them into the book. And if you salt the sections every couple of pages, if you have that kind of detail, it makes the whole thing feel like it's out of the 17th century. Um, another example was, and I got this out of the Oxford English Dictionary, um, there was a phrase, uh, I was in a mix. Oh, I was in such a mix. <laughs> and we know, we don't use that phrase anymore, but we, we kind of know what it means, right? When you're confused or whatever. Um, I was in a mix. So you have the characters say that. And again, um, that goes a long way towards making the world feel legit and real. Well, as someone who also considers herself a, reason, a reader, I love that you got all of these details out of diaries and other books and other things from the various time periods. That's great. Um, so one of the questions I was going to ask about the characters before was the one thing they all seem to have in common is that they all seem to be the other or the outsider. 
um, someone who's definitely sort of at a disadvantage given the standards or what people think is um, appropriate or quote, normal for the time and they have to figure out a way you know to find acceptance or to survive in some cases so was that something you did intentionally or did it work out that they all were sort of the the other yeah i think it's intentional um one of the things i was looking to do in the book was to have the five i didn't want to simply write five different stories um, and just stick them together that i wanted the different eras the stories from the five different eras i wanted them to be mirror reverses of one another or inversions of one another um, in some way or other be similar stories or have similar conflicts uh, moral questions if you will uh, and yet not the same somehow inverted or reversed or something um, so it was natural I think that having established that tennis player you mentioned before he was my first character the 21st century um, tennis player who although he, at one point he was the 47th best player in the world, still feels like a loser. That somehow if you're not a top 10 player, even though you're a stupendously good tennis player, <laughs> because you're not a top 10 player, because you're not Roger Federer, you're somehow a loser. Mm -hmm. And so this is eating at his character and that's his outsiderness, if you will. So having established that character, the other characters I looked to create as in some way or other, that outsider quality um, that he feels. Um, and so each of the characters in some way or other, for instance, the, uh, the gay man, Franklin Drexel, um, who is necessarily in the closet. This is 1896 after all. Um, so even though he is part of um, the Newport mansion world, that great, the beau monde of the 400, he's part of that world, but he feels very much um, on the outside of that world because he can't really partake of it because his secret self prevents him from, from, from being part of that world. And so each of the characters, even the young Henry James, feels himself somehow excluded from life. He's an observer of life without really participating in it. Um, so each of the characters has that kind of outsider look, which of course, simply from a novel, novelist standpoint, is simply good good stuff, right? You, you're interested in people who feel that they are in some way or other in conflict with the world around them, with the society around them. So it's good for that reason as well. Um, but it was also a deliberate attempt to have the characters be shadows of one another in some way. Well, and you mentioned something about some moral complications and, and none of your characters are perfect. That makes for a pretty boring character, probably. But um, you know, and you also teach writing, yes. So I don't know if you talk to your students or you think about this as a writer about the importance of likability of the characters or people being able to empathize even when they're doing bad or shady things um, to get what they want. Because this, it, it, it was very interesting the the measures that some of the characters, you know, um, the things that they did and they were definitely hurting other characters in the book in the process. Right, well, good characters tend to be boring, I think. Um, I think that's really true. Uh, Charles Dickens is a really good example of that. He was an absolute genius at creating interesting secondary characters, but his main characters, David Copperfield, for instance, who's a normal young man, is really rather boring. It's the people around him, Mr. Micawber and so forth. Those are the characters that I think the world really loves. Um, so you've got to have, your characters have to have some flaws, weaknesses. They don't have to be out and out unlikable. I don't mean that. Um, but flawed thinking, moral lapses and so forth. These are, this is what I think makes novels interesting. Um, you mentioned about uh, my students, uh, but just in general, I think I would say that I don't think characters in novels have to be likable. They've got to be interesting. Yes. Um, if a character is not interesting, you've got a real problem. Um, but I would, I would go so far as to say that you don't need likable characters, but they do have to be compelling in some way or other. Yeah, well, that said, I don't know. I have to admit, I'm not sure if I was rooting for every character, um, but for the most part, I was. And well, I have well, one. 
So I'm, I just want to interrupt and say one of those characters, uh, the major Ballard character, you're most definitely not supposed to be rooting for. Right. Okay. Is an out and out. Well, I don't know if he's evil. I don't know if it quite rises to the level of evil, but uh, he is certainly an out and out um, despicable man in some way or other, um, although troubled in his own way. So I hope even then, I think he is not likable, but somehow one understands him in a way, I hope, even while he's being despicable. Yes, and I have just one more question about the character, which is Henry James. And this is another question about whether you were daunted, because I think, um, you know, as someone who has a, a lot of respect for the, you know, the, the um, classic authors or the authors who might be members of the canon, you know, to make him a character in your book, it seems ambitious and I loved it, but that might have been a little bit scary, no? Yeah. Um, fortunately, you know, he's only 19, 20 years old uh, in, in this book. Uh, so he's not quite Henry James yet. I didn't have to worry about sort of imitating the James uh, manner of writing. Um, he's just a young man starting out, uh, even wondering whether the, the trying to become a writer is really the right thing for him to, to, him to do. Um, I love James and I've let, read a lot, a lot, a lot of James and I've taught James over and over again. So I know his voice and I know his language. It's in my bones, I think. So it wasn't difficult to write a 20 year old Henry James. Um, I was a little, uh, when you say daunted, I was a little like, oh, I hope this goes well. Um, other writers have written um, about James, have written books of, about James from James's point of view. Um, but it's always older. It's, he's always the full grown writer. So I thought it was really interesting to try to imagine myself into the young, he was a very bookish boy, you know, and he, and he stammered, uh, he, he didn't speak well. And he had just uh, returned, he had gone off to Harvard for one year um, studying the law because he didn't know what else to do. And it was a pretty much a disaster. <laughs> he had some, some moot court that he completely flunked out of. And I like to think, or I don't like to think, but I like to imagine that it was because he couldn't speak well enough in this court. You know, if you're gonna be a lawyer, you've gotta be able to speak well. Um, and James had this stammer and he, he, and he hide, hide himself back to Newport and he didn't really quite know what to do. And he hadn't told his parents yet that he was not going back to Cambridge. Um, so I take him at that point, this sort of weak point in his life when he changes and becomes, begins to take those first steps towards being a writer. Um, I have to say that just like all of my favorite English professors from the past, you talk about writers and characters as if they are people you actually know, which is such a wonderful thing. Um, so we have some questions from our alumni who are listening. Um, Mark is asking, regarding your comment about not dressing up old characters in new clothes, given that you are not historian, how did you go about making sure that the historical empathy was accurate, especially given the number of periods and situations that are covered? I know we talked yeah. about this a little bit, but if you wanna elaborate on that. Well, I hope it. I hope it's accurate. I mean, I think it's important to remember that it's a, it's a piece of fiction. It's a novel. We don't look to novels for absolute historical accuracy. And there are things in the book that I'm aware are inaccurate. Um, for instance, uh, someone someone here is from uh, Rhode Island. I, I I think I heard you say. Mm -hmm. And if anyone else has ever been um, to Newport and gone along um, the Cliff Walk, there is a it's, it's half beautiful and half ludicrous. There's a red Chinese tea house that's perched out above the surf, um, and that was built uh, by Mrs. Vanderbilt. Um, she wasn't Mrs. Vanderbilt at that point. She had already remarried. Um, but it was built like in 1912 or 1914 or something. And I had to backdate it to 1896 because I needed that as part of um, the interplay between the different eras. It's visible um, from Windermere in, in 2011. Um, so I needed it to still be there. I needed it to be there in 1896, even though it wasn't actually built until 1912. So that's not a mistake on my part. Um, it's just saying, 
I'm going to move it back uh, 15 years and have it be there. Uh, I think that's what they call poetic license. And I think that sort of thing is okay. Um, but I'm sure there are, I'm sure there must be inaccuracies in there because I can't possibly know all five of these eras historically in, in historical depth. Um, but I think the inaccuracies would be probably pretty minor. Um, I hope they are pretty minor anyway. And in all the traveling around and the, and the writing, the reviews and the interviews I've done, I haven't had anybody catch me out on anything. Um, uh, maybe they're just too polite uh, to, to, uh, to point these things out to me. Um, but I haven't run into that too much. Um, I did my best. Um, and in a novel, of course, it's really the characters and the characters' hearts and their struggles that you're really concerned with. Um, you try to get the other stuff as, as accurate as, as you can. Um, so we have another question, which is from someone who says um, he hasn't read the book yet, but he is sure that there's some message or takeaway that transcends each of the five stories. Um, and we did talk a little bit at the beginning about how you came up with this, but his question is, did you start with an overarching story or message or did that part evolve over time? And if yeah, yes, how did you avoid the risk of force fitting a preconceived point of view onto each of the stories? Right. Um, maybe here we can talk about your title a little bit too. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, the guiding idea behind the book when I was starting it was the idea of duplicity, the idea of doubleness, of having hidden motivation or something. And in, in the first, the book is written in three sections. And the mm -hmm. first section is actually called duplicity. Um, and at one point, um, I was even thinking about calling the novel um, The Maze at Doubling Point. Because I had, when I was living on the coast of Maine, I lived in this place called Doubling Point, which is a point where the Kennebec River doubles back on itself. And so I liked that idea of, of using the word doubling as a way of doubling the thematic idea of duplicity. But in the end, The Maze at Doubling Point didn't sound as good as The Maze at Winter. <laughs> So I changed it uh, to, to that. But, the, but to, the, to, the, um, to the listener's question, uh, the overarching unifying idea was this, this idea of duplicity. And when you uh, were mentioning earlier um, that some of the characters hurt other characters or have um, uh, not good uh, moral motivations. I think you could trace all of that to this this idea of duplicity, of working behind the scenes in some ways for what you want. Um, some some of the characters are doing that uh, to to some degree um, innocently; they don't really realize it, and other characters are doing it in, in, with full full realization. So I started off with that corner of the human heart, if you will as a thing that would unify the five stories. And so that I think um, allowed me to avoid imposing some kind of external thing that, that you mentioned, uh, because there's, there's duplicity, I think, in everybody's heart, even if you um, try to fight against it, it's there some way or other. Um, and so the book was attempted to be about that. Consequently, the, the title and the image of the maze or the symbol, if you will, of the maze is really related to that idea of duplicity, um, that the human heart itself is a kind of maze, I think the book uh, is, is saying. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't always know what direction we're going in, where we're trying to go, and the means by which we're going. And that's all part of this sort of duplicitous maze of, of the heart. Yeah, and I actually have, um, I, I found this interesting because that the cover that I have is the one that's on the left-hand side of the screen here. And then I, I was looking and I found a different cover. Is the cover on the right for the paperback? Is it, and I, right. I know from experience, you know, with um, people I know who are authors, you don't always get to control what the cover looks like and sometimes not even the title. But um, I just think this is really, I really like the cover on the left. Um, the one on the right actually shows the maze. But. Yeah, um, exactly right. Uh, that is indeed the cover of the paperback, which I think, I don't know what the release date, but the release date for that book is like in a day or two. It's called, the, the paperback is being released in a few days. Um, I loved 
the hardcover um, artwork. Um, mm -hmm. And you're right, authors have almost zero, I won't say almost, zero say in what the cover of their book is, <laughs> especially with the big New York publishers. If you're, if you're publishing with a smaller press or with a university press, meaning a press that's perhaps not quite so worried about um, sales, uh, then I think the authors can have some input on it. But with the big New York publishers, um, you know, it's all about the marketing, the publicity, and what they think is going to uh, make you open the book and plunk down your money for it. Um, and I have had other novels of mine, um, which I have not been happy with the covers. But this one, um, I thought was absolutely fabulous. It is the, it's an absolutely stunning cover. Um, very, very interesting uh, how the art, uh, the artist did, the graphic artist did that. Um, it's really, really nicely done and gets some sense of the book's maziness without actually being a maze. <laughs> um, and I wanted them to use that for the paperback, but they came up with this other one, which I also like. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like it as much as the hardcover, but I think it is, it too is rather lovely and has something slightly darkly sinister about it or something like something's happening behind that hedge. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but both of these, I think, uh, are fine with me um, <laughs> having had less luck with other books. So I have to say, I'm just going to applaud us for doing a pretty good job so far of not having too many or any spoilers. Um, and so we'll, we'll try to keep that going because I know there are people who are listening who haven't read the book yet and they, I know they're all excited to read it. Um, but let's talk about the maze a little bit more. You talked about the duplicity and I'm curious about the games. You mentioned one, but you know, tennis is a very interesting um, game that can sort of act as a metaphor for what the characters are doing because it's such a mental game and it's one person against another and there's also chess that figures in. So. Um, does that have anything, did that, you know, become part of the plan or it just, it just happens to work very nicely? Yeah, I think that's, that, that sort of, that chess thing, which, um, I think there's, oh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if ever all five sections have a, have that chess motif happening, some more than others. Um, but that came about by accident. Uh, it just sort of started happening. I think it began... Um, in the 18th century section, when the, the, my British aristocrat who's stationed um, um, in Newport uh, plays chess with a Jewish merchant named uh, Isaac da Silva. Um, and that became a kind of running thing in that piece. And so in this, again, in this interest of having the sections interlock with one another, I started importing it into other other sections um, and this idea of playing of there being squares off outside the chessboard that there's mm -hmm. the 64 squares of the chessboard but in fact there are squares off the chessboard that was a, a lucky moment for me because that again that gets into the idea of this duplicity or of the maze of this there being a reality beyond uh, the 64 squares of the chessboard um, and that became something of a controlling motif throughout throughout the book um, so that gamesmanship um, that happens between major ballard uh, and the jewish merchant um, that was something that opened up uh, into the book as as a whole and so that the, that question of games as you're saying became one there are a number of motifs in mm -hmm. the book the cemeteries is another one um, there are a number of motifs that recur throughout the different parts um, sometimes as I say changed or darkened or mirror reversed or something um, but that gamesmanship was one that developed as I, as I was as I was writing the sections yeah, and it seems like we are aware of the motives of the main characters and the secondary characters are trying to discover or figure out their motives and also the main characters are trying to figure out what's motivating the actions of all those secondary char characters. So there's definitely that, you know, everyone's trying to figure out what's really behind everyone's actions. Right. Um, so now let's see, I had my question. Oh, so again, we're gonna try not to do spoilers, I, I don't think, but we need to talk about the structure and possibly the ending. So you mentioned the first section of the book is called Duplicity. The second section of the book is called Substance and Shadow. 
And in those two sections, you maintain separation between the storyline for each of the characters. And then in section three, we have, it's called the maze at Windermere and it, it changes. So the, the chapters are not distinct characters anymore. Things sort of fall away and everything is happening with all of the characters sort of at the same time. Um, and this seems like it requires an enormous amount of trust in your reader that they have gotten to know the characters well enough that this will, they will still follow. An enormous amount of trust in yourself and your own writing to take away the structure that you've built up around everything. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, yes, the first two sections um, are written in reverse, uh, excuse me, re yes, reverse chronological order. So they go, 21st century, uh, 19th century, and so forth. So they go 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and then they cycle back to 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and they go like that th th throughout. So while, um, while that first, that might be, what the heck, what's going on if you're a reader and you're, you're not aware of that, very quickly, I think you catch on um, that you're cycling in this pattern, in addition to which the sections have the, have the dates, 2011, 18, 19, 16, uh, 1896, excuse me, um, they're printed right up front um, for each, each section. So I think fairly quickly the reader catches on and says, okay, so this is what we're gonna do. We're just gonna go five, four, three, two, one throughout. So the first section is done that way, the duplicity section. And then the second section, Substance and Shadow, which was by the way, the name of a, of a book that Henry James Sr. James's father wrote, and I just liked the sound of the title. And since the book, as I say, is these sort of um, objects and their mirror shadowies or something, so this idea of sh substance and shadow, and it, as well as the motivation thing, right? The motivation that's in the sunlight, and then there's the motivation that's in the shadow or something. So I rather like that. But those first two sections are written with this pattern, which as I say, I think the reader discovers um, by page 50 or so, and then, then can follow their way through. But the third section, this section called The Maze at Windermere, dispenses with that, as, you, as you've noted. Um, there, the sections simply happen, and, and they're not, you don't have the dates anymore. So it's really up to the voice of each section to clue you in as to where you are. Um, hopefully, so it's about page, what, 280, 300 or something like that, which is when the third section begins. Hopefully, by then, you've got, uh, yeah. you internalize the voices <laughs> of these characters and you can tell the difference. Um, really, there's a very big difference in the language between Prudy's, the Quaker girls, 1692 and, and the other characters and so forth, exactly. In the afternoon, I retired and prayed that I might labor toward wisdom. Well, my 21st century character is not gonna be talking like that. So I think you can get that. But the point of this really was that I move the reader into the maze itself so that the narration itself, which has always been a little mazy, but a maze that you feel like you figured out. But now you move into this third section where um, you don't have that, uh, that guidepost anymore. And, and the narration itself becomes a kind of maze. Um, although, as I say, if you make it that far through the book, I think you're with it and you're gonna, you, you just go with it because you know the characters by then, you know their voices. Yes, definitely. Um, and, you know, the endings are so tricky. I don't know, you know, how you decide how to conclude things. Um, and I, you know, I have to say just in reading, um, reading the book and then reading a few uh, reviews of the book in order to prepare, prepare for today, I feel like, because all the reviews were glowing, by the way, as hopefully you know, because you read them, I feel like the one concern that, that people seem to have is that not all of the stories had a satisfying conclusion. And I don't know if that matters to you. You know, it didn't really matter to me because I feel, you know, as someone who reads a lot, it's very comfortable in the gray area and not knowing for sure what happens. But um, is that something that people have asked? Do they want to know what it, happened? It, it's an interesting question. And there is definitely um, a, a, a group of readers out there who feel a little frustrated by the open-endedness of the <laughs> endings. They're not all completely open-ended, um, but no. there is an open-endedness to the five endings. 
some people seem to object to that. They really want to know like what happened. Um, I didn't want to do that and that felt wrong to me. Um, what I wanted to do was to gesture toward a possible ending so that each of the uh, sections has the poss possibility of an ending. Um, and I can't use, I can't illustrate this because that really would be giving things away. Right. Um, but each, each of them, they don't just stop in the middle of a day or something like that. Each one gestures towards a possible future for the characters. It doesn't say that that's what's going to happen, but each one paints a possible future for each of the characters. Um, and that was good for me. Um, but as I say, um, there are some readers who would prefer it seems it would prefer a fuller or more complete or more um, absolute ending to the pieces. But as I say, that just felt wrong to me. That's fair. Um, so we don't, we don't have too much time left. I just want to encourage everyone who's listening to submit any last minute questions they might have. Um, Cause I actually just want to ask about this Walt Whitman quote that was in the beginning of the book. Um, do you want to tell us about that? Sure. Because um, I was curious. I mean, a Walt Whitman quote is always wonderful, but um, that's your jumping off point, it seems, or the jumping off point for the reader, anyway. Right. Yeah. Um, this is from Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, uh, a marvelous um, poem. Um, and this idea of what is it then between us, I think is getting back to the, the person who asked the question, what was the overarching? This is another overarching idea. This question of what is it then that between us, what unites us across the centuries, right? What is the count of the scores or hundreds of years between us? What is it that human beings in the 17th century share with human beings in the 21st century? But Whitman being Whitman, that's, there's more to that word between, because between is one of those words that means itself and its opposite. What is it then between us? What is it that unites us? And what is it between us, what is it that's keeping us apart, right? So it's a really interesting line. And I think it's really perfect for the book because the book in many ways is trying to find what is it that unites us across the centuries? What do we have in common? What does the human heart have in common? And yet within each of those eras, the stories themselves, the characters are in some way or other um, prevented from uniting, prevented from knowing one another or fully knowing one another. Um, so there's always something that unites us, it seems to me, as human beings. And then there are the recesses of the human heart or simply so so societal restrictions um, that seem to get in the way of uniting us. So that quote's there for that idea, I think. It's beautiful. Um, and so let me just put these covers back up here as the reminder that you can get the, the hardcover there on the left or the paperback that's coming out soon. Is there anything else you want to tell your fellow alumni, your readers, future readers? Um, and I also have a page here that has some photos of some of your other books. Um, yeah, see, it's that, it's, that, it's that middle one. That was the cover they unveiled to me. Uh, and I thought, I just, I just hated it. Um, that, that fellow down in the lower left-hand corner looks like he's, he's like a, a reject from some ashram or something. Uh, I didn't like it. I didn't mind the, the it's, it's a book about um, a shakeress, um, about a woman, uh, the last shaker. I didn't mind the picture of her looking demure and chaste. That was okay. Uh, uh, um, the television is a guy on the left-hand corner. He had to go, but I didn't have any luck with that. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so we have your current book. We have your previous books. Um, is there anything in the works? Is that one of those questions you hate to answer? I mean, no, I'm curious. I, I, so curious. I, I, now. I am indeed. Uh, 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 I am about 150 pages into a new novel. Um, can't say anything more than that about it. Um, but I am uh, slowly dragging another novel out of the out of the computer. Uh, well, we wish you best of luck on that. I can't imagine um, the hard work that goes into that. 
But um, I really enjoyed this book and I'll have to reread it maybe when I go to Newport sometime. I like to go to Newport in the summer and watch tennis at the Tennis Hall of Fame. So maybe I'll take this along with me for my- Maybe I'll see you there because I like doing that too. Yeah, that's wonderful. Right. So I have just one more slide here before we all take off, which is, um, because we actually have a, a book talk here on campus. So those of you who are listening in um, other parts of the country, other parts of the world, um, this one's a local event. So we have a book here, um, which comes out in March. It's not quite out yet. I had the privilege of reading the book, the early release copy of this. Um, I just finished it. Completely different book. This is an international spy thriller, but it was written by two alums. So Gary Grossman and Ed Fuller, are, are both alums of BU and they've worked together to write this book. So this will be our next book talk um, and you can come and enjoy it in person if you'd like. And the web address is on the screen there to just find out about other events that we have coming up. So hopefully I'll get to see some of you in person. And Craig, it was such a pleasure. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you just started your new semester at Carleton. So you have students back on campus ready for class. So thank you so much for taking the time and to everyone who joined us. Um, we hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.